Well, good morning, everyone. I think we're all ready to get going. Um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Jeffrey Van Kutsem. I'm part of the uh, Open Source Technology Center at Intel, and I'm here to present, the, together with my colleague Mike Adira, the connected smart home from IoT to cloud. So I'll let Mike introduce himself, and then we'll go through the material that we have put together for you. So hi, everyone. Michael Kadera. My job is I work with uh, Jeffrey on IoT to cloud, but uh, my job is actually to make the cloud easier for people to use and consume. And so I've had uh, a lot of different careers within Intel, all for the most part within data center, but also within Intel's IT department, where I worked a lot on their enterprise applications. Platform as a service, I also implemented a number of their cloud environments. and so. Now I get to the opportunity to talk with customers and work with them on implementing their own. And so today, what we'll do is we'll show how we're, we're actually able to bring an IoT solution to the cloud and start to look at the choices we made, why some of them were made certain ways, and how to bring together a solution architecture. With that, <clears throat> let's take a look, quick look at the agenda we will cover today. So we will, first of all, give you a few of the considerations that we have taken into account when we just set out to develop this, uh, this prototype or demo, as we can call it. Um, we will then go through the different building blocks that we, we have used. Uh, we will give you a little more background on IoTivity and the uh, Open Connectivity Foundation, because that's kind of a, a very important part of the demo itself. So I want to make sure that everyone is up to speed on what that is and why we're using it and how it can be used. Um, we'll talk about web platforms. Again, a very important component of the technology we have, and we use it throughout the chain from IoT to cloud. Um, and then we will talk about application profile and the different solutions that can be used when we're putting together a, a cloud solution. So the way we get organized is I'm work, more working on the IoT side, so I will cover the first half of the presentation, and then Mike will take over and talk to you about the cloud aspect of this. You are, of course, welcome to raise your hand if you have questions. Uh, we don't expect to use uh, the entire time, so I think we would probably have at least 10 minutes towards the end of it for further questions and answers. But again, if you want to have questions during the, uh, the session, just raise your hands and we can address those. With that said, let me just jump uh, to the next one. So what are the different considerations? So first of all, Mike and I were kind of looking, both of us part of the Open Source Technology Center, we were looking at how can we demonstrate and maybe prototype what an end-to-end -end solution looks like? So you get, when you get to talk to people, a lot of these are, are kind of focused on IoT or focused on cloud or focused on networking. And we were really looking, both of us, I mean, Mike coming from the cloud angle, uh, uh, myself coming from the IoT, we were like, okay, how could we sort of reuse and demonstrate these technologies, not individually, but also uh, working together and sort of integrating them into an end-to-end -end solution that makes sense. And so our objective was kind of a, that was kind of a, one of the motivation we had. Now, as we set out to do that, we were considering different options. And we were like, okay, being open source people, we obviously wanted to use open source solutions where we had some that we could use. Um, similarly, we also wanted to use open source projects and use open industry standards where possible. And what that gives us is, first of all, industry standards we believe are very important for enabling the growth of IoT or cloud. But open source solutions is also something that we can easily, more easily control and we can tweak and tune, and it's a, very, it's a great learning experience. So one of the things actually we got out of that is also a lot of uh, experience and, and knowledge that we didn't have before as to what are the challenges that people face when they want to put together a real life solution, something that will go in production, that will be sent to customers or sold to customers that will need to scale, that will need to be robust, etc. cetera. Um, so we also looked at things like, how can that be deployed easily? How can that scale once it's been deployed? The idea being, as you're a young company sometimes, you, you have a great idea, you develop a solution initially, and then your customer base may be 100 people. Now, as you grow that user base, hopefully to thousands of them, you don't want to have to re-implement that stuff over and over again because it didn't scale in the first place. So what we did with Mike is we looked at that, and, and with that in mind, hoping that the stuff would scale, how do we just build it from day one so that the scalability, the scalability comes very naturally? And the final aspect, which was obviously very important these days, it's, it's uh, considering security. So you'll see a little less of that, but it's kind of, you don't see that in the way we've put it together, but you see that in terms of 
what we selected to use in terms of technology. And all of the technology we use have a very solid security foundation. So this is a, a, an overview of the architecture of what we put together. And by the way, for those that perhaps have not been there, but we had the demo running on the Intel booth. Uh, it's the one that looks like a little doll house with a few sensors and a cloud solution. So this is a representation, kind of a, an architectural overview of what we have. So let me just walk you through some of the stuff we, we have put in there. So on the, for you, it's the left-hand side. On this side, we have the, really the IoT part of the house. So these are the sensors we have put in there. We have around 10 sensors today. Uh, different, they're simple sensors, but they sort of demonstrate what can be done. So we have things like a solar panel, we have temperature sensors, motion detection, uh, CO2 detectors, and that kind of stuff. Um, for those, we, all of these are part of the same network running in the house, and we leverage a lot of web platforms such as Node.js and IoTVT. Um, in the middle here, this is the gateway that we have. So the gateway is the home gateway. Uh, we run a, a Yocto-based OS on that one, and this is uh, the sort of the central point where it, it, it's collecting a lot of information about every sensor in the home. So that's kind of a, it's again, it runs the IoTVT stack, but, and that's what is then our bridge to the cloud. So the cloud is what you see on the right-hand side there. So everything in the cloud, you see things like OpenStack and Cloud Foundry. So this is what we use to bring scalability to the cloud aspect of it. So again, the idea is it's kind of easy enough to have an application that connects to a single gateway and collecting information about that gateway and providing perhaps things like uh, extra services such as analytics or perhaps a simple cloud portal. Now, the, one of the key function is as you grow your user base, you still want to be able to then scale that and have 100 portals running at the same time or perhaps 1,000 portals running at the same time. So this is where we started building that on top of OpenStack and Cloud Foundry. Um, again, one of the selection criteria we, we used is to think we can use cloud providers, but we also wanted to look at how could that be done uh, by ourselves directly. So which is why you, you don't see us necessarily using uh, Amazon cloud services or Google cloud services. It's not because it cannot be done. It was really kind of a mental exercise of how we would do, how would we do that if we were to do it ourselves. Kind of a part of the whole learning and also perhaps some companies actually may choose to say, I'll set a private cloud versus using a public cloud. Um, some of the components you there, I'll go through some more, some more of them in, in details. Um, but let me talk a little bit more about IoTVT and the Open Connectivity Foundation. So how many of you in the room are familiar with what IoTVT is and uh, OCF is? OK. <laughs> oh, we've, been, we've been good. We've changed it once. <laughs> it's acceptable, I think. <laughs> I've seen much worse. So just. I see a few hands, so that's, we, I don't need to spend too much time on the topic, but uh, for those that don't know, um, the Open Connectivity Foundation is an industry consortium of, of companies. I think we have a, more than 130 companies today. And um, so they, these companies got together and are defining a protocol uh, for device-to-device -device communication in the IoT world. Yeah, let me just move, because we're video recording that, and I was just behind the pillar. Um, so they... The, the problem they're trying to solve is the fact that today, if we let companies develop sensors, develop uh, smart devices such as smart television, uh, washing machines, or even simple sensors, the problem is if there isn't a unified uh, industry standard for defining and talking to these devices, we end up with a bunch of protocols that are basically the ones defined by the companies respectively. So OCF is there to provide a unified solution that everyone agrees on, that you can be compliant to, and that means in your home eventually, no matter what vendor you have, so if your fridge is coming from a specific vendor and then you change over time, you don't need to redesign and reset the rules and, and reapply a lot of the stuff that you've done already. The fridge will be seen as a fridge. It will be recognized as a smart connected fridge. Um, and so that's really what enables not only it will make it easier for people to adopt the technology, but it's that, that's also how you can really make the, the smart home really smart. Because smart today sometimes means we're starting to connect device, and that's about as much as they get. So they get connected, but still to talk to these, you still have to have dedicated applications for each. The real smart home will become uh, available when you start having intelligent action taken based on different inputs. So things like, uh, I don't know, the 
nobody is home, so you don't need the air conditioning system on. So the motion detection will tell you if there is someone home, and the air conditioning will be turned on and off based on that, and also based on the temperature. So you aggregate data and, and set up intelligent rules based on that. But for that to happen, you need to have devices that can talk to all of these sensors, to all of these uh, connected appliances as well. So this is what OCF is, is doing. So OCF is very much, um, like I said, so it's an industry consortium and they're, they're focusing on developing certifications and, 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 um, and standards. Now, I, the other project which is related to it, it's called IOTivity. So IOTivity is an open source project. It is host, uh, hosted by the Linux Foundation. And their objective uh, is also to provide a complete implementation, a reference implementation of the OCF specification. So you don't have to do it, but you can use it. It's there uh, to be used, and it's, it's compliant. It's uh, released under an Apache 2 license, which means it's uh, easy to adopt for companies that want to adopt it. Uh, and then the certification aspect is something that, again, is more linked to the OCF part of it. Now, on to the building blocks that we use. Um, we have a number of hardware platforms that we use and a number of software components. So let me go through some of them for you. Um, on the left-hand side, what you see, it's a Mino board Max board. So it's an Intel-based system. We use that device as a gateway on our platform. And we typically run a Yocto-based OS. So you see different logos because we actually can run different uh, different OSs. We've played with different, we've played with Ubuntu Core, for example. We've played with the IoT Reference OS Kit, which is again built using the Yocto tools. And so we don't really have a very strict dependency on the OS. So it's the code that we have is very portable. Uh, but typically when we present the demo, we use a Yocto based OS. Uh, it runs, I mean, it could be connected to a screen, but the way we run it, we run it headless today. So that's the gateway. So again, that's the one. It acts in the OCF terms, we say it's the OCF client, because it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a sensor itself, but it's connecting and collecting data about the sensor in the home. It's actually also the one bridging uh, our network with the cloud. Now what you see there, we have other devices. Some of the sensors we have are actually based on the Intel Edison module, and uh, more and more we're actually moving to use the Arduino 101. So the Arduino 101, it's a very, very small device, low power, based on the Intel Curry, and we run another open source OS, which is not Linux, because it's way too constrained for Linux. So we run something called the Zephyr project. Uh, there were many sessions, I think, at this conference on Zephyr, so hopefully everyone knows what it is. Um, but for those who don't, I think the quick way of describing it, it's, a, it's an open source, real-time OS, hosted by the Linux Foundation. Um, if I was to sort of make a, an easy distinction between that and Linux, it's, it's typically you run that where you can't run Linux. So think about microcontroller type devices, uh, devices that have just a few megabytes of RAM or maybe a few kilobytes of RAM or flash. So really where you can't really push the Linux kernel down to those spaces. And, so, and that's what the uh, Arduino 101 is. It's a very tiny device. So more and more, we actually started by developing and prototyping a lot of the sensors we had using Edison, because it was the, easier, the easiest for us to have them up and running. And now that we have Zephyr running on an Arduino 101, we're just gradually bring them over to that Zephyr environment. Um, any question on building blocks so far, or on the, the architecture of the, how we've done that? No? Web platform. So let me talk a little bit about the web platform. So the, what we mean by web platform, it's kind of a collective term that I use, and we use uh, because we see that technology used at different point in the, in the demonstration or the prototype. So we use that. Um, on the sensor side, on the IoT side, um, we have a project called IoTivity Node. Uh, these are the JavaScript bindings for IoTivity. So a lot of the development we've done is actually using these uh, JavaScript bindings. What that gives us, as people not necessarily just putting device in production, but it gives us an ability to prototype new sensors extremely quickly. It's very, very simple to have an OCF server written in JavaScript. I mean, a lot of the sensors we have, and all of the code we have is published, so you can go and look at it for yourself, but it's about, I'd say, 30 lines of code, and that's all you need. Now, obviously, the more complex you want the device to be, the more lines you have, but a simple sensor is about 30 lines of code. And a lot of that can be reused whenever you change the device type. So very, very quick prototyping from our perspective. Uh, we initially run a lot of that stuff on a standard Linux environment, because that's 
obviously a, a lot easier to develop on Linux because you don't have any kind of constraints in terms of memory. I mean, even debugging is easy because it's a full-fledged Linux environment. Um, now, obviously, in terms of hardware, uh, running a temperature sensor on an Intel Edison is not something that anyone would really want to do in real life because you get a big beast, it's too expensive, it's too big, and it doesn't make sense to run just a few sensors of that. So we started migrating those um, over to the Arduino 101, and what we're trying to do more and more is actually leveraging another project. Um, it's, its nickname is ZGS, but it's really a JavaScript runtime for Zephyr. So again, it's not exactly the same code, but it's very, very similar. It's a JavaScript code, and it allows us to create uh, devices that are OCF sensors, OCF servers, that's the right term terminology, uh, and connecting them to the network. So the connectivity part is a little different. Uh, when we had the Edison board, we were using either wired connections or wireless Wi-Fi. With Arduino 101, uh, everything is done over Bluetooth low energy and six low pan. And where you see all the components of the web platform, uh, you have at the middle something that says it's the IoT REST API server. So what that component is, is basically an OCF client running on the gateway, and it exposes all of the uh, OCF API over HTTP session. And so that's how the cloud connects. So basically what you do from a client, a standard OCF client, things like uh, device discovery, and then retrieving data about devices or sending commands to device, you can do it very easily from the cloud, but from the cloud, instead of having to do that over co-op, we now can do that over HTTP. And then from a cloud perspective, a lot of the, the components that exist out there can deal with HTTP because they've been doing that. And when I say HTTP, I really mean HTTP or HTTPS. That's going back to the, my first point about security. So all of, all of that can be run on, on secure channels. Um, so what you see on the right-hand side, it's actually a snapshot um, of the cloud portal that we have designed. So the intention is we developed something that would be, okay, what could a user see if they were to log on into the portal and observe what's going on in their house? So that's the design we have. What you see at the top level, you see a few alerts. So these are the things that, are, that should be grabbing your attention. So on the left-hand side, for example, you see a little alert in red that says, oh, I have a CO2 detector that's gone off. So there must be smoke somewhere in the room. So I bet, better look at that. Um, the second one you see is basically there is a motion detection. So that could be something uh, at your front door telling you that there is someone walking up the aisle or about to ring your bell. Um, Others that we have, and we've started building up and adding to that, and that's what Mike will talk about, a lot of the analytics. Because collecting data is good if you want to take a snapshot, if you want to check what temperature you have in your, in your home. The smart home, again, being really, really smart, will become when you can do some sort of clever analysis on that data. Perhaps telling you that it looks like you have too much electricity going, consumption going on for the temperature that's outside. So perhaps you have a faulty heating system, or the air conditioning perhaps is about to there is something wrong with it because it's consuming too much. So that kind of data is the kind of, or that kind of um, information is stuff we can retrieve if we have powerful data analytics engines running in the cloud. Um, another aspect of the, of the demo that we have as well, and you, you show it, there, we can see it there at the bottom on the right hand side. We have also developed a smartphone application. It's, a, it's an Android app. And you can run that directly, so it, it again runs the same IoTVT stack. And it's a single app that can detect and will allow you to see all of these devices. So similar to what you have in the cloud, but from your smartphone. And with that, we'll just go over the application profile and I'll pass that on to Mike. All right, thanks Jeffrey. Okay, so I've really enjoyed working on all the IoT projects, and they're a, lot of, they're a lot of fun because, for me, one of the challenges I've had in working with all the customers that I meet, even when I was in Intel's IT department, is helping them understand the benefits of cloud applications, and IoT really lends itself really well to that because sometimes they're connected, they scale really rapidly, people start to really understand the concepts and why you need to have failover and those types of things available. But what I wanted to do is just go into a little bit more of what's different about IoT applications because if you've come from an IoT environment, you know that the first thing when a customer comes to you when they want to land 
of application or series of applications is you lay out the application profile. So you really need to start looking at those things that are different. There are many things that are similar, but let's take a look at some of them. So starting with the behavior. Initially, you're going to have you know, some of those projects that are predictable. Those are great to have. You know, they're, from an IT perspective, you know what to expect. You can go ahead and plan it, but not everything performs that way. So some of them, of course, high growth. How are you going to respond to that? So if you have to scale rapidly, are you going to have infrastructure in place? You know, if you're moving from um, purchasing to get new hardware to landing it, power, cabling, I mean, I know when I was in our IT shop, it could take anywhere from uh, uh, two to three months on average just to land infrastructure from the purchasing point all the way through to having it powered up and landing customers. You need to plan ahead if, that, if that's part of your constraints. or Think about bursting into other data centers, cloud re, um, public cloud advantages. So additionally, IoT applications are not always connected. Sometimes they're on or off. You need to know how to transfer that data if you, know, if you have a, a truck that's moving through the mountains and, uh, and it loses its connectivity. Is it going to have the information it needs to, to maintain its route? Are you going to be able to update information on your inventory and that it's, it's safe? How is, how are those connectivity, how is it going to be managed? And then lastly, kind of the heart, one of the harder ones to manage is that random or periodic bursting. So really setting things up so you can grow your applications and scale them to other data centers or other resources. Because sometimes your customers may be where you don't have data centers that can reach them. It might be, make an advantage to either set up a data center there or leverage uh, public clouds. Continuing down the list, microservices. Have, have you heard of, has anyone here heard of chaos monkey testing? So a few people have, yeah. So this is something that uh, Netflix really started a couple years ago. I think it was like five or six years ago. And the whole idea is that imagine you have a monkey just running crazy throughout your data center. And it's going to go through and it's going to start chewing on cables and beating up systems. But the whole point is you don't know how your application is going to perform under that kind of circumstance. So what you, we've developed is, they developed and others have implemented, is writing your applications in ways that it's resilient to services that you aren't expecting failing. And that's how microservices kind of come into play here. You want to really move away from those gigantic do it all applications and start pulling out those individual pieces. So for example, you have a login service and um, a catalog service and all these things need to work together as well as operate independently should something happen. And so what you need to do when you're working on microservices is think of those logical ways of dividing these applications. And you gotta be careful because sometimes I've seen people go a little bit crazy with the microservices and every little thing is in a microservice, but think about bundling it together and bringing those solutions together. But what happens is that you can then eliminate single points of failure. In the past where you have this one gigantic server that houses everything, you can now have a farm of servers and VMs or containers that would allow you to do that failover and scaling that, uh, that you can implement. Now, on top of that, because you're going to have these distributed services, you need to look at collection orchestration. And what that really means is how are you going to organize the deployment of your application? You need to have that database first. You need to then land uh, caching services and web services that will connect into that in the right order. But that doesn't stop at the cloud. You also need that with your individual IoT devices. Your gateway in place, how are you going to do that handshake of new devices that come on and how are you going to grow and scale them as well. All needs to be thought of because uh, they need to grow together. You know, one of the things we found in many of the device or applications that we deployed is that uh, our database usually tended to be our constraining point. And so what we would do is we would have one database and then, or a, a database with its replication and then uh, um, caching probably five to six on some of these applications and web heads. Um, 10 to 12, depending on what it was. And so that was basically our collection, and we, would, we called it a pod, and we'd scale by these pods, and that's how we would grow and shrink back. That's the key piece, is you also need to know when to shrink back, and you don't want to be, especially if you're paying a premium dollar for that compute, you want to make sure, make sure you're scaling back down and releasing those resources. Okay. 
the life cycle. You know, this is, uh, I've, I work quite a bit with OpenStack, and in the community, one of the things that they've really been focusing on really over the last couple of years is upgradability. Specifically, where things are really challenging is when you have multiple services all working together, you need to make sure that their APIs all work as one. How do you do that when you're going through and doing this upgrading? And that's why you have to have sometimes maintaining multiple APIs and do that rolling upgrade to allow critical services to continue forward. That really becomes very important in the cloud, but you have to think about your gateway and those services that are gonna be tying into that as well. Continuous integration and deployment. You know, this really gets into how you're going to be managing those individual devices. If I have a uh, device that's in the wall of my house and I don't wanna have to rip something out of the wall to have to go in and flash it, I have to think about how I'm gonna be pushing code to it, pushing updates, keeping it secure. That becomes a big part of that as well. So you need to plan for those things in your, your environment. Security, you know, um, when uh, I last presented on this, uh, I think it was uh, back in the fall, um, you may remember the, that uh, web camera that was hacked and created the denial of service attack. So it, was, it couldn't have come out at a more perfect time as to when uh, I was talking about security, not that it, we were looking for an advantage with that, but it actually helped me make my point. There's so much with security and not only making sure you're patching those devices and keeping them up to date, but looking at authentication and user authentication as well as device authentication, making sure you know what's on your environment and your, you know what to allow. Data encryption, whether it's at rest or in transit, becomes really important. You know, I, I really started getting into the IoT tinkering because my kids kept on leaving the garage door open. So, you know, I didn't want my, my bikes and my tools going walking off. And so I put a sensor on there so I knew when it had been left open for all. So depending on where I was, I'd always get the alert and I can close the garage door. Unfortunately today, I had a little bit of a problem. True story, my garage door fell back down on my car while I was backing out. So uh, I need an alert that warns me if it's not safe to back up. <laughs> it's one thing to add. So um, we talked a little bit about patching, but then on, on the far end with the network intrusion detection making sure that if something is an anomaly, you're, you're actually picking that up. So all of there's, of course, security goes much further than this. Lastly, data. That's why we're here is to, and why we're looking at IoT is to bring all the great things that uh, that data analytics and knowledge of it can bring you. But location comes into mind and what you can do. There's so many different options because the cloud, they can seem like endless amounts of resources that you can use and scale. You can have, you can have uh, historical information, a lot more data, data library available for you to use. But you can do that detailed analysis at the cloud. But now start thinking about as we start moving towards uh, the edge. And this is what, uh, there's a great uh, presentation that, that Tom Bradich from HP gave about, I think it was about six to nine months ago. And what he introduced was the spectrum of insight. And I thought it was a really good way to help uh, give everyone an idea of how things are changing as far as compute available from the cloud to the edge. And if you think about it, as you start moving to the left, that's where all the devices are. Then you get into the, the tier one and tier two, that's where you're getting into the more intelligence that's being added with those gateways. And what he's saying here is that there's options and trade-offs that you give at each level. So, in the cloud, as I mentioned, you have endless scalability. You know, you have uh, endless power, cooling, all of those things available to you. And so you can do that detailed analysis and it, it doesn't come at a high cost. Now, if you move to the edge and you start thinking about if I have a device that I need failover for or if I need detailed analytics at the edge. So for example, if I'm driving my car and a truck goes out in front of it, I should say it's an autonomous car and a truck goes out in front of it, I wanna make sure that I'm not sending that data off to the cloud for processing. I wanna process, process that locally and not barrel right into that car or that truck. So that's why you're starting to see that you know, these, these uh, vehicles are becoming basically data centers on wheels, but it comes at a cost. There's a lot to go into that safety design, the compute and cooling that's needed at those levels. And so 
you have that trade-off, but you're seeing more and more capabilities coming to you and being able to do that analytics at the edge. You know, when I pull my car into the garage, I don't want to actually track every single moment that uh, my car was out driving that my tire pressure was 35 PSI. I know that. I want to know the anomalies. So I don't want to have to have a data array in my garage just to track that. Track the stuff that's important. Filter the stuff that's important. Send that to the, net, to the, the cloud for the analytics you need to track. So there is so much we can talk about with the cloud. So I'm going to give a high-level overview. If you have any questions about uh, these um, areas in detail, just uh, come over and talk to me. But uh, really looking at how you're going to service these applications in the cloud, there are lots of choices available. Now looking at it from the cloud perspective, you have lots of great solutions, software as a service that uh, many of the, uh, the bigger manufacturers have out today. You know, Samsung has their things, you know, so you can just plug in a sensor, have your gateway recognize it, boom, you know how to use it and it integrates with your environment. Philips has stuff like that too. But if you're developing your own, these are some of the solutions that you'll need to think of in bringing that to the table. So um, as Jeffrey had man mentioned, we're using Cloud Foundry and that's a platform as a service solution. Now what this does is it gives you a, a, an API that you can just push your application to. So it allows you, it will recognize that you're using the LAMP stack or uh, various components and it'll deploy and provision that in locations that make sense for you. And what it does is it allows you to scale rapidly. So it can go from just a couple of instances deployed and it'll load balance that as you scale it on up. It makes it really easy in making, allowing your developers to go from code to production rapidly. But additionally, there's big data analytics. Um, we're using a, a Python solution in our environment and what we're showing is collection of data based on some, we found some house analytics based on power and uh, temperature. And we overlaid that, if you stop by our booth and check out our demo, we overlaid that with Portland weather. And so you can see how the house would perform at that. But what we're getting the value out of it is when we start ad adding additional simulations of data at, at scale and seeing if you're, for example, managing a grid and what you can do with all of that detailed data analytics. So within the environments here, there's lots of tools to allow you to scale and deploy those big data as well as regular databases to help you with your applications. Now, VMs, containers, that, uh, that comes down to choice and how you like to deploy your applications. Uh, VMs, um, traditionally a little bit more secure, but uh, a little bit more heavyweight with uh, speed of, of, of deployment and ease of provisioning. But so each have their trade-offs and then containers, um, you know, it takes a lot more to secure them. Definitely you can. Uh, there's lots of solutions available and their use case is wonderful. Real rapid startup as well as things like Docker Hub. You can create images, download them, deploy them. It makes upgrading and keeping them going forward very easily uh, maintained. And so um, we also have, we're doing a lot of work within Intel and in the community to help secure containers a lot more. There's lots of, uh, of different options from trusted attestation to, uh, I'm wearing a clear Linux shirt. They have something called clear containers uh, that help to leverage that uh, technology at the, at the hardware level, at the physical level to secure those more like a VM. But uh, I really, those are choices that you'll have to make and uh, um, I really like, I, I, now that I've used both platform as a service and containers, they, they really make development a lot easier. Now underneath all of that, I mentioned of course I use OpenStack, but there's lots of things available. Kubernetes to orchestrate containers. Uh, VMware has their solutions. Microsoft has Azure. And of course there's multiple public solutions with Amazon, Rackspace, and the list goes on. So the important point is that you have the API just like you would with a platform as a service solution to allow you to scale your compute storage and networking. And lastly, with physical layer, the important point there is you have your resources where they're necessary, failover of course to keep in mind, but making sure you're taking advantage of the capabilities at your physical layer. So making sure you're passing through things like if you're doing heavy duty encryption workloads, you can actually use uh, things like AES and I, maybe an FPGA if you have to want to offload that capability to, uh, to the hardware. It really makes the performance of your applications um, that much better. 
So really kind of summarizing this and, and where we've been with a lot of uh, the, this project as well as the experience that Jeffrey has had in working with multiple customers and IoT and uh, mine in the data center is really looking at how you're going to manage that data because that's a big part of how you're going to construct your overall IoT solution. At the edge, in the cloud, a little bit of both. You can even have intelligent network devices. There's lots of options available for you. And the balance of analytics with that location. Compute power is available, of course, in the cloud, but uh, the, the heavy-duty compute power at the edge could become costly if you're operating under extreme conditions, lots of vibration, cool or hot temperatures, things like that. Scaling. Always make sure that you build these applications to grow. Opportunities like Cloud Foundry, um, OpenStack make it a lot easier to design that scaling into the cloud. But also look at it from the gateway, how much your gateways can handle, how you're going to scale these devices and systems with them. In the end, with the microarchitecture, is just understanding how these will all break apart and just know your application requirements. That's really what, it, in the end, that's what it comes down to, is you have to know what your, your customers want and how you're going to service that. And lastly, IoT applications, they lose connectivity. It's not, I wouldn't necessarily call it an issue. It's more of a feature. Design your application to really withstand that and have the failover necessary. You know, you don't want to have a, a factory that's, or for example, like a bread manufacturing, and just because of a cheap little temperature sensor breaks, you want to make sure you, you shut down the factory. You want to make sure you have redundancy within that as well. Okay, to kind of bring it all back together, as I mentioned, know your application requirements. So remember that, and that's one of the things you can take from that um, and plan for scalability. So that's uh, expect those services to drop. That's one of the things with microservices. You can have failover. You can also do that with devices as well. Our demo that we have in our, in our uh, booth is actually available for you to help, to help jumpstart some of your projects. Fully open source. Go to 01.org slash smarthome. All the directions are there, plus a link to our Git route repo. Uh, that uh, QR code will link you there as well. And lastly, IOTivity. This is what makes uh, all of the sensor connectivity and the uh, ease of use within uh, that environment much easier to use. So just uh, IOTivity.org. And with that, I will open it up to questions. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not sure that I want my grandson's uh, <laughs> uh, image, you know, going streaming up to the cloud and that. Um, the other, kind of completely different here, is the cost model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the first question was about privacy and protecting, like for example, web cameras and uh, streaming images of your family or things like that and making sure you have privacy there. You know, what I've found with applications in general across the board is that uh, security comes with a cost and it's, uh, it really comes down to how secure do you want to make it. it not everything is 100% secure. But you really need to do the, I think, due diligence in looking at the companies and providing how well have, are they patching their systems, how well are they securing their environments, have they done the penetration testing necessary to make you feel at least comfortable that it's going to be maintained. Uh, it's a choice. Hopefully everyone makes the right one, right? <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, in the end, you, we all support our companies with uh, what we purchase, right? Yeah. Uh, now, the, the next one was um, really cost and that cost model. 
um, you know, really, if you look at that trade-off as well, there's great solutions out there that provide that automatically for you. You can pay a license for someone who's done a, a great solution and carries the, that burden cost, that startup cost of a large data center to support those applications. However, if you look at things like, for example, just getting started, um, you know, there's low-cost startups that you can use, like for cloud services, that uh, to get started on that side. Now, on the design side, I probably turn that over to Jeffrey if he wants to talk about, uh, you know, startup costs with IoT devices. I don't know if you had any recommendations there on uh, how that would scale. So, uh, yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I think the question was also how that would scale and who would pay for that eventually. Yeah. Yeah, not, we've not looked at the cost model that deeply. I think that the way we look at that is, is as we enable the smart home, I think a lot, of the, a lot of the value in this IoT domain will actually come, and that boils down to having all of these sensors being able to talk to each other. That, that's why we started introducing things like analytics. I think anyone, I mean, throughout the chain would be more willing to chip in and provide I mean, put money on the table if they're really getting value out of it. And the value just cannot be only I can read the temperature sensor remotely. So that has to be a combination of things. So it's providing a service that I perceive as, as adding value to my, I mean, if it's you as an individual, it's going to be, uh, like in the, the example of smart home, it's probably you as a family, you see value. So for example, like Mike saying, Mike knowing that the, the garage door will be closed uh, if, if it should be closed because there is no one in the house and then so that, that's a value to him so he's probably willing, more willing to put in a few dollars or whatever is needed to get that up and running. Um, and so the whole IoT explosion, I think it will be unleashed whenever you have these interactions and when the, the systems really become smart. Um, that's for the smart home and I think the dynamic will probably be similar but a little different if in other segments. Um, so things like industrial, the industrial guys will probably have similar things when you can automate, um, I don't know, manufacturing plants, for example. Uh, they'll probably sustain a lot of the costs, but only if they get really a good return on their investment, so. Yes. Boy, well, in my opinion, I look at the manufacturer to stand behind with a warranty. Yeah, and then the ownership is also, you know, it's my, so for example, it's my due diligence to make sure that my home network is secure. Um, you know, I don't, I don't rely on Comcast to do that for me or others. I mean, they do, I, I expect when things go out beyond that, I think that, that we all own a portion of, the, of making our own environment secure and knowing how to use those tools. I think the, w when I look at that, one of the dynamics we've seen so far is a lot of, the, very often the gateway in the house is the stuff that is, I mean, it, it's provided with the service. So if you get a Comcast, then they probably have a, a, a gateway that they sell to you. So I think I'm, I'm not excluding that things like home gateways, maybe boxes that will be subsidized by the companies providing the service. I think the way we look at that, other devices in the home will most likely be the stuff that you want to have, like an alarm system, or you'll have, I mean, you buy your fridge because you want that fridge of that color, that model. And so you want that to be able to interact with the rest of the systems. But I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying, and I may be wrong, but I'm not necessarily saying a model where these devices become all part of a, a one just big giant package that you get from a provider. No, I mean, I've heard about this Alexa. Yeah. Being the witness to a model. Yes, I did hear about that, yeah. Ooh. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's a good There is this that's case where in Germany they recently banned a toy where they said it's not actually a toy, it's a spy. Because it can be hacked and people can actually start uh, controlling that toy. Yeah, I think there's a lot going on in the courts with legal that are, you know, it's, it, it's evolving and people don't know how these use cases are going to eventually be used, good or bad. You know, I, I don't have an answer for you because I, I'm not sitting on the court and I don't, uh, yeah. But I think there's a lot going on. Yes? Uh, I agree with this topic here that the retail industry, I mean, is, there's no money in updating devices. It's, these 
sell it in retail cheap, I don't want to see it again. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the way it works. It's just people buy stuff at the cheap. So I agree with this discussion. It's hard to put. But my question actually is, uh, that was my first question. We could handle it already. But my, my second question really is that if you look at today devices that I have uh, uh, either designed or or helped our customers design, they are being driven in their architectures not by uh, all this open protocol. They're driven by the cloud providers. Because the cloud providers that you decide, they have an SDK that you download. That's the first thing you do on your platform. You download the SDK. That provides the connectivity to the platform. And Azure has it, you know, Microsoft, uh, AWS has it, uh, Samsung has it, IBM, and they all have mm -hmm. it. And then you write your application next to that, okay, which basically is reading a sensor and putting it in some JSON, and then you're done. And that seems to, so I see this dichotomy happening. This is my question. People designing a network in the home that needs to be very, very relatively complicated, and then just uh, the cloud providers saying, this is the way to do it. Mm -hmm. Quick time to market. And I don't know where it's going to win. So what's your view on this whole? Because I see a big dichotomy of things happening like this. Um, yeah. I don't know where it's going to go, but I, I, it's, nobody's just talking about it, and I see many devices that we have supported in our company that, that do it from the cloud provider side. That's your first choice. Who's my cloud provider? Where's the SDK? I'm done. And who owns the data? Well, and, well yeah. that's what it is. I mean, the data, it's, it's the, 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 the data is, it goes to the cloud because the sensor costs 20 bucks and that's the end of it, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, I think that's the reality today is that the cloud providers are driving this. And uh, I just wonder what cloud providers are supporting some of this stuff. Okay, because that's what I do. I call all my, you know, I help people is download the SDK and they'll update the SDK every now and then. Yeah. With MQTT or AMP, whatever, whatever they're doing. Whatever communication. Or app, yeah. Whatever they, they, they have. And it's, then you're locked into that. There's a lot I know from the cloud side that's going on to help with as far as data ownership and making sure that your data is yours. For example, from when the point that the data leaves you, it's encrypted at uh, transit and it stays encrypted. Um, and then you maintain those keys elsewhere. Uh, that's, that's been a lot of work I know that has been going on in that space. Uh, multiple companies working on that. Uh, this is just, you're right, there, there's no easy answer here. There's a lot that's going on to uh, really implement the and understand security. I think that there's, there, we're seeing more um, announcements like the, uh, the, the uh, web interface, uh, the, the webcam that uh, I had mentioned. You know, I think that those types of things are making the, making the issues in security um, more relevant, that people need to pay attention. This is a big deal. Yeah. OK, we have one more minute. So OK, one more question. Uh, alternatives to IoTivity and, uh, um, and oh, so the question is, is if there are different, well, similar solutions in the industry for. <clears throat> okay. Um, so the, the the way I compare them typically is is it's with something similar to what Apple is doing with HomeKit, for example, or Google Weave in terms of functionality. Now they're different in the approach because obviously Google Weave and well Apple HomeKit they're uh, driven by a, com a company, so you're sort of uh, tied by what the company decides to do and how they want to take that. The approach that uh, OCF is taking is more kind of a, a compromise in terms of let's get the industry player together, all agreeing on a on a on a platform. And I think from what we've seen is uh, Google Weave, for example, HomeKit. They're very focused on the smart home. IoT is by nature. They have had a lot of focus on the smart home, but they're really also looking at that technology as something that could be used in different segments. So not only just the smart home. Um, so I think this is, there were, uh, back in the days, I was going, I think the, the, there were two standards that were really going head to head on that was mostly, uh, OS, well, what was known as OIC back in the days and all join all scene. Now all of the players backing up one or the other have actually got come together and now OCF is kind of the merging of these uh, in many ways. So I think this, what we're seeing now, and this is going back to your point earlier, I think a lot of the dynamic to see is it's not really, it's driven by uh, opportunism by companies, they see a gap that they can fill by providing a service that doesn't really exist. And so it's a little chaotic, chaotic at the moment. 
And I think what we will see eventually is as the market mature and as the, these technologies penetrate and get, make their way into their homes, then we will see things settling down. And in general, when you have a more mature market, that's when you start seeing industry standards set while really getting a stronghold of those. Um, so now that will have to be paired with uh, compelling services too. So I think to, re to go back to your question, I think that this, from an industry standard, um, there isn't really a second industry standard. Uh, it, IOTVT is already the result of different trends going in slightly different directions and sort of looking at what they were doing and thinking, okay, we just get, we have to get together on that. It doesn't make sense to have two or three. So you see your thing converge? Yeah. I mean, it will never converge to a, a single solution. That doesn't exist, but I think it will consider, I mean, things will consolidate uh, over a handful of solutions is, is something that we'd expect. So I think with that, we're out of time. We'll be happy to take more questions outside, but we'll have to make room for the next session. Um, if you want to have more questions, we'll be outside, or we can grab us whenever you see us around. Thanks.